to a, another video on respiratory review. In this video, we're going to talk about recruitment maneuvers. It's a topic I've been wanting to make a video on for quite a while, um, but just haven't been able to get around to it. So let's get stuck into recruitment maneuvers. Um, this is not going to be an exhaustive review of everything that you could know about recruitment maneuvers. There's lots of uh, sort of fundamentals in lung mechanics and lung physiology that you, you would need to kind of understand, but uh, we'll try and get through it together and talk about a few things. So why don't we start off with just what I think a, a reasonable definition of a recruitment maneuver is. <clears throat> so I would say that a recruitment maneuver is a deliberate application of an elevated transpulmonary pressure, which is alveolar or sometimes called plateau pressure minus pleural pressure. And this is uh, with the intention to reopen previously collapsed lung units which will increase the surface area for gas exchange and promote a homogeneous distribution of ventilation. So that's a bit of a mouthful but it's essentially applying pressure to the lungs with the intention of reopening collapsed lung units to improve gas exchange and promote better distribution of ventilation. And why do we want to do this? So what are the proposed benefits of doing recruitment maneuvers? Well, there's a, there's a few things that people cite. One is this sort of idea that we're hopefully going to protect against this ventilator-induced lung injury, like VILI. Um, and that's due to trying to, if we can recruit the lung tissue and keep the lung expanded, we're going to re reduce the, this repetitive uh, collapse and expansion and collapse and expansion of the alveoli which has been shown to be kind of um, detrimental. And we'll also reduce the shear forces applied to the lungs. And it's, it's difficult to, to uh, make a video on recruit maneuvers without giving a bit of a nod to the Lachman study. Um, so Lachman, this is, study, is a fairly old paper, but um, came up with this idea that at the junction of recruited and de-recruited lung tissue, so at that point where atelectatic and recruited lung tissue meet, the lung is exposed to huge shear forces when large transponding pressures are applied. And that's at a transponding pressure of 30 centimeters of water, the shear forces at these junctions can reach like over 140 centimeters of water, which is uh, like intuitively de deleterious and shown to be deleterious as well. Um, so there's lots of uh, sort of motivation for why we'd want to do recruit maneuvers. It seems like these would be a great thing to do. If we can get the lungs open, recruit lung tissue, that sounds very positive. Um, but there's been fairly inconsistent and uh, not that exciting results out of large trials that have looked at recruit maneuvers, particularly in uh, ARDS models and in the big uh, ventilation studies that look at ARDS. It seems like recruit maneuvers are, have not been shown to be that helpful, um, at least on a routine basis. I think there's a few reasons for that. I'll try and get into that as we talk about the different types of recruit maneuvers. I think one of the major reasons is that recruit maneuvers are kind of added as this almost binary topic in these trials. It's like, did the patient get a recruit maneuver? Yes or no. There's, there's no effort to figure out which patients would respond best to the recruit maneuvers. Some may not. And we'll get into that in just a second. And there's, there wasn't really much effort to say what type of recruit maneuver patients had in these trials. And largely, probably because these are large databases, there isn't big standardized protocols for how people do this. Um, but even if we just touch on one of those things, like uh, the question of uh, are recruitment maneuvers for everybody? And that's what I think is uh, an interesting question. Like, should everybody that um, we think has ARDS get a recruitment maneuver? And at least some of the literature that's out there would suggest that maybe not. I think that there is there is a few things that would predict people's response. There, are, what we're noticing if you review the literature and do and do these on people in the ICUs is that there are responders and non-responders like there are for many interventions. And there's certain things that seem to have come out of certain trials to suggest why people would respond or not respond. And this extravascular lung water, so increased like pulmonary edema or extravascular lung water, seems to reduce the efficacy of recruit maneuvers, at least in this study. And that predisposed people to complications. Uh, there's also a suggestion that lung morphology 
can predict the response to recruit maneuvers in AODS and that patients who have focal or lower loss of lung aeration tend to respond poorly to recruit maneuvers. And what tends to happen is that instead of recruiting the poor atelectatic inflamed tissue, you just over distend and hyperinflate the healthy tissue. And that's what seems to be seen in focal loss of aeration in the lungs. And remember that AODS is this uh, I describe it as a sort of an in inflammatory atelectasis, like it's a collapsed, inflamed lung. Um, whereas patients who have more of a diffuse or patchy loss of aeration, they tend to have a good response to recruitment maneuvers, suggesting that there's it's not a one-size-fits-all therapy. Just meeting the criteria for ARDS doesn't mean you should necessarily get a recruitment maneuver. And this was shown in other studies as well. This is Eddie Fan's group from Toronto who showed the same thing, that focal lung morphology um, tend to have a poor response to recruit maneuvers and uh, a higher incidence of complications. So we, in a short time, we've hopefully been able to convince you that uh, while recruitment maneuvers have potential to be very positive, not everybody is going to respond well to them. And thinking about that is going to be helpful when you when you manage these patients with severe ARDS. So in the remaining time, I would, uh, my goal would be just to talk about two different types of recruitment maneuvers and show you how that there's quite a stark difference between the two and try and understand some of the principles of what, of how we do this on a ventilator and, and um, what the pros and cons of each of them are. So we'll start with the sustained inflation recruit maneuver. This, I would say, is by far the most common way of uh, delivering a recruitment maneuver uh, in ICUs, in the operating room, to ARDS patients. And it's called a sustained inflation maneuver because we are literally just holding a sustained inflation. What, um, Practically speaking, what you can do on a ventilator for this is you can put patients onto like a CPAP and pressure support mode. You can decrease the pressure support to zero. Um, and you increase the CPAP or the PEEP level uh, to your desired recruiting pressure. Now, often these are 30 centimeters of water for 30 seconds or like a 30 for 30 trial as it's called. And then somewhat arbitrarily, it seems to go 40 for 40. I'm not sure why if you do 40, you need to add an extra 10 seconds of time. I think it's because it sounds good and it's easier to remember. I'm not sure there's any benefit beyond that of, of uh, why it would be an extra 10 seconds. Um, so these patients probably at that stage of illness are not going to be spontaneously breathing. You could m make a whole vi video arguing about the benefits and disadvantages of spontaneous breathing in ARDS. We won't get into it. Uh, some of these patients may be paralyzed. Again, there's sketchy evidence for whether or not pr paralytics uh, um, have any benefit in, in ARDS management. But Ultimately, you don't want the patient really like bucking or coughing or anything against these. So these patients are often sedated um, and you would hold this recruit maneuver for uh, 30 seconds um, with the goal of increasing lung recruitment. But if we think about what we're actually doing, we said we wanted to increase transpulmonary pressure, right? And that was our goal when we described what uh, recruit maneuvers were. Now, as a refresher, transpulmonary pressure is that alveolar pressure minus pleural pressure. And transpulmonary pressure is the pressure that distends the lung tissue. That is our recruiting pressure. Um, so that's the thing that's going to open up collapsed alveoli. That's what we need to overcome critical opening pressures of collapsed alveoli. It's transpulmonary pressure that's doing that. So that's what we're targeting. So in a study in 2008 in the New England Journal of Medicine, they looked at uh, mechanical ventilation and uh, using esophageal pressure manometry to estimate pleural pressure in ARDS patients. And that's a validated method of measuring uh, or a surrogate method for measuring pleural pressure. And that's important because that's part of our equation here for transpulmonary pressure. And what they found was that uh, average pleural pressure in acute lung injury in ARDS was 17 centimeters of water, which is pretty high, right? That's the average. So if you have a pleural pressure of 17 centimeters of water, if you do a 30 for 30 recruit maneuver, your transpulmonary pressure will be 13 centimeters of water, right? That's a pressure that's unlikely to recruit collapsed, inflamed, atelectatic lung tissue that we find in ARDS. It's unlikely to overcome those high critical opening pressures that we know exist in ARDS. So I think that just the pressure itself is insufficient given how high uh, pleural pressures tend to be in patients with ARDS. We also know from literature that 98% of recruitment occurs in the first 10 seconds of these sustained inflation maneuvers, uh, suggesting that the remaining time is 
not providing a huge amount of benefit from a lung recruitment perspective and exposes the patient to complications and uh, side effects of the maneuvers. And this is why I think if you look through the literature, you'll see that sustained inflation recruit maneuvers rarely show anything other than transient benefits in oxygenation. Um, and they're associated with complications like hyperinflation, desaturation, and hemodynamic instability. And I think part of the reason we get these transient uh, oxygenation benefits is that there's really no effort in these recruit maneuvers in this sustained inflation maneuver to optimize the patient's ventilation settings after the maneuver. W presumably, the, the settings that they were on prior to the maneuver were insufficient and not and leading to de-recruitment. And then we put them back on those settings after we've done the 30 for 30 trial. So it, it to me, it just doesn't seem like it makes enough effort to optimize their lung recruitment after we've performed the after we performed the inflation. We need to we need to reestablish lung recruitment, but then we also need to maintain it. And I think that's where sustained inflation maneuvers uh, lack some of their efficacy. So looking at a contrasting um, type of recruitment maneuver, this is a staircase uh, or stepwise recruitment maneuver. Uh, this is what I prefer. Um, there's uh, not outstanding evidence comparing the two. There's some trials that suggest that staircase recruit maneuver is better. There's some, some that suggest that it's equivalent. This is what I think makes more sense from a from a pulmonary mechanics point of view, just physiologically. This just makes more sense to me, and I'll explain why I think that. So in a staircase recruit maneuver, you put the patient in a pressure control mode of ventilation, and you give them a fixed delta P or a fixed inspiratory pressure um, or a pressure control setting. This would be in a pressure control. Um, and in this example, it's 15. It doesn't have to be 15. It probably shouldn't be much higher than 15 because we we know from our like the driving pressure trial published in 2015, we know that driving pressures are a big deal in ARDS and that we want to limit large driving pressures in in these patients so this keeps a fixed driving pressure a fixed delta p and then we gradually escalate the peep so this is 15 above the peep so the peep say five here 15 there gives you 20 of total pressure and then you increase the peep and this stays fixed 15 above the peep stays fixed and over the, there's different uh, protocols for this but this might be a minute for each of these bars sometimes it's two minutes so you can see that these can take a while and you gradually increase the PEEP and you increase it up to uh, pressures that often are intimidating for people. These are much higher pressures than most people are comfortable delivering through a ventilator. Um, and uh, But I think they're necessary and hopefully I'll convince you of that. So by keeping our driving pressure fixed and by gradually increasing our PEEP, we protect the lungs from large changes in pressure and large shearing forces associated with big swings in pressure by keeping our uh, delta P fixed. This high levels of pressure are more likely to open inflamed um, atelectatic lung regions. Um, you also get the benefit of having ventilation during this time. You can set a respiratory rate um, to make sure you're still clearing CO2 during this maneuver because this can take a bit of time. And then once you've reached your recruitment uh, at the top, and so let's say this is 35 of peak plus 15, giving you a peak pressure of 50. Um, you'd hold that for a few minutes and then you stepwise de-escalate the PEEP. And during this uh, phase, we're doing what's called a PEEP titration. We're trying to back off on the PEEP and find the point for this individual patient that we think their lungs start to either de-recruit or show different uh, levels of compliance. So there's a couple of ways of trying to identify this kind of de-recruitment point, which is what they call it. Now, some people, uh, some of the studies will suggest using oxygenation measures like uh, pulse oximetry, and you just track when they start to desaturate, uh, and that would be their de-recruitment point. Uh, others suggest using um, like lung mechanics methods, like l checking their uh, lung compliance dynamically as you do this maneuver and finding the point where the lung compliance is optimized. Um, and then you re-recruit the lungs once you've figured out where you think this de-recruitment point is. Re-recruit the lungs back up to uh, the pressures you went to the top and then you set your new optimized quote-unquote peep above the level that you thought the de-recruitment point was. Now, 
is this a perfect strategy? No. Are you going to get the de-recruitment point right every time you do this? Probably not. But at least you're thinking, you're individualizing your approach to that given patient. You're not doing a one-size-fits-all intervention and hoping it works on your patient. You're performing almost a little mini experiment and you're looking at the feedback that the patient's lungs are giving you and trying to figure out what the best strategy for them is, um, which is why I think this is more effective. It's individualized. So there's some evidence out there to suggest that this improves oxygenation, improves lung compliance, reduces inflammation and ARDS. Now, these patients, like the sustained inflation maneuver patients, can have desaturation during these procedures. Uh, so it's important that they're well monitored. It's important that you have good hemodynamic stability prior to initiating these things. You don't want to do this on a hypovolemic patient with poor LV function. They're not going to tolerate it. Uh, so you, if the patient's on norepinephrine for their sepsis or whatever, then uh, it's you may need a transient increase in that while you're performing the procedure. Um, but these transient desaturations during this procedure are well tolerated in general, and uh, the literature suggests that it doesn't preclude these patients from having a positive response to recruitment maneuvers. They still get good lung recruitment. Um, now, the downsides of a thing like this, this is pretty time consuming. This can take quite a while to, to, to sit there and do this. And it takes someone who's dedicated enough to kind of learn about this stuff, has enough knowledge of lung recruitment and ventilation to figure out the de-recruitment points and optimize their PEEP. So it's more challenging. It takes a more well-trained person to do these types of things. And they need close monitoring, just like the sustained inflation maneuver. But my argument would be that this is this is a a more individualized approach and it makes more sense from a physiology perspective and a mechanics perspective. So uh, this is running a little bit long, but hopefully this is given a bit of an indica uh, a sort of whet the appetite of recruitment maneuvers. This is two types of very common, uh, well, one very common type of recruitment maneuver, one growing type of recruitment maneuver, and what I thought the sort of pros and cons of each were. Thanks for watching.